Our TV caravan proceeds along the historic highway from Dariali to Hornabuji, which once connected the northern countries with Asia. This route was an important military political factor and a trade economic artery in the Middle Ages. After leaving the King Tamar Fortress in the previous episode, we passed Gavaletti, the village of Tsudro, Stepansminda, entered the Snow Valley and crossed the Bursaciri Pass on the road to Gudamakari. Finally, we reach Pasanauri, where the black Aragvi joins the white Aragvi flowing from Mtiuleti. The central route of this historic road was through the Busachiri Pass, but these days it is used only by shepherds and tourists. The two gates of the Caucasus, Dariali and Derbent, were the subject of geopolitical confrontation. Everyone knew that only through these two crossings was it possible to withdraw a serious military force posing a threat to the South Caucasus and in the Middle East. The central government of Georgia controlled the entire road from Dariali to Hornabuji. In our experiment, we already showed how cities and fortresses transmitted information to each other through a signaling system. Our destination is Hornabuji. However, before moving forward and arriving in Jimvali, we return from Pasanauri to Hevi. From there, we have to take two more routes. In the previous episode, we explored the route to the Snow Valley. This time, we will follow the right bank of the Terek River towards Javadi Pass. If a traveler coming from Dariali, and instead of turning to the Snow Valley, chooses to go forward, he will soon reach the village of Kobe. From Kobe, the roads lead in three directions. One of these roads led up to the Javari Pass, which Vahushti Batonishvili called the way to the center of the cross. It passed through present-day Gudauri and Deep Valley, reaching the Kvesheti community, where it would follow the Aragvi River to Pasanauri. The present-day road follows this route as well. The second direction was to the Truso Valley, where you could travel to Dvaleti, Shindakartli, and western Georgia. The third road crossed the Hada Valley and joined the road to Mtiuleti. The Javari Pass Road is still functional today, with a motorway accessible to anyone. The roads of Truso and Hada are relatively forgotten, so we will talk about them. First, we will enter the Trousseau Valley and then go to Jean Valley through the Hada Valley. The Truso Valley is rich in mineral waters. Sour streams flowing from the mountain slopes create beautiful travertines. Almost the entire valley is subalpine and alpine. Rarely will you see a tree here. The famous lake of acidic mineral water has an estimated depth of about 80 meters. Today, this place is easily accessible even by regular cars, so there is no reason why you should not see this wonder of nature yourself. In this beautiful lake, delicious aerated mineral water springs up from the ground. 
This water has the same taste as it had in the times of King Vakhtang Gorgasali. This stream here is entirely sour water, flowing and never ending. Zakagori is a village at the confluence of the Terek and Suatisi rivers. It is situated on a high, inaccessible mountain. Today, no one lives here, but in the Middle Ages, it was an important strategic point in the defense of the Trousseau Valley. Abano is one of the oldest settlements in Trusso. It had an important military strategic function as this village was in the center of the Trusso Valley. It protected one of the branches of the road going to the North Caucasus. The village of Abano performs its historical function to some extent even today. In winter, it is impossible to enter the Trusso Valley by car. For this reason, Almost the entire population leaves this place in autumn. However, the valley is not left completely unattended as monasteries still function. We return to Kobe from Truso. From Kobe, we will move to Khada Valley. From Hevi, we moved into the Khada Valley. This was once one of the routes of the Caucasus Highway. It is a small valley in Tiuleti, but with a great history and unique nature. With mineral waters, pristine rivers, beautiful waterfalls, and alpine meadows where the weather and the colors of nature change several times a day. One can rarely find another place with so many fortress towers over such a small area. Hada, immersed in idyllic tranquility today, was constantly at the center of political events and lived an eventful life. 
The inhabitants of Hatta fought for King Tamar. Later, they selflessly resisted the punitive troops of the Mongol invaders. The road from Hatta follows the Aragvi Valley to Pasanawori. At the top of the ridge separating the Aragvi and Ksani Valleys, there is a church named Lomisa. It was the main shrine of the Mtiuleti and the Ksani Valleys combined under the image of St. George. Residents of the Aragvi and Ksani Valleys used to gather here in order to make important decisions. Everyone was afraid of breaking their word spoken near Lomisa. It is suggested that a lunar temple was originally built here in Lomisa, then later a Christian church was built in its place. The road from Leta to Kasani Valley, Shida Kartli, and western Georgia passed through Lomisa. The road from Kvsheti follows the right bank of the Aragvi River up to Pasanouri, where it joins the road from Gudamakari to Jinvali. This part of the road is lined with towers that had the function of transmitting messages in addition to their defense function. On the way to Jinvali, all travelers were noticed the Ananuri complex, which was the residence of the Eristavi of Aragvi. Ananuri is not an ancient building. It must have been built in the 16th century. It seems that this place acquired strategic importance after a united Georgia weakened, disintegrated, and the city of Jinvali did not exist anymore. For in a time period when the large and powerful city of Jinvali was protecting this junction of mountains and plains, naturally, there would have been no need for a fortress such as Ananuri. Jinvali embodied and defended the interests of a united state while Ananuri's purpose was to provide the security of a separatist feudal lord. From the Ananuri fortress, the Aragvi Eristavi tried to subdue Shaf Hefsurati i Mtiuleti Hevi. These times are preserved in the people's memory with a painful verse. In Nugzar Eristavi's times, it was raining blood. The Middle Ages, however, are no exception, and plenty of blood was always been shed throughout human history. This fortress also remembers brutal and ruthless civil wars. The struggle between Ottomans and the Persians for control of the South Caucasus began centuries before and continued into the 18th century, when a third party, Russia, who was actively advancing toward the South Caucasus, became increasingly involved in the conflict. The main goal of all three empires was to control the gates of the Caucasus to gain an advantage over the others. As is often the case in similar circumstances, the military economic weakness of Georgia's internal political situation depended entirely on external factors. The anatomy of one of the tragedies that took place in the Ananuri Fortress in 1739 shows how the geopolitical controversy affected the fate of the people. There was a prominent political figure in Georgia at that time, Shansha Eristavi of Ksani, a very active and influential feudal lord. First, he fought with the help of the Ottomans against the king of Kartli, an ally of Persia. Then he sided with the Persians, and this time he was fighting against the Ottomans. Finally, he again rebelled against the Persians and retreated to Russia. His political opponents also switched sides. The Aristavi of Aragvi took advantage of Shansha's absence and, in addition to plundering the estates, kidnapped his brother's wife and passed her to the Persian soldiers for fun. Meanwhile, Shansha once again changed his political orientation, returned from Russia, hired an army of legions, and had his revenge. The large family of the Aragvi Aristavi, children, women, the elderly, warriors, were all burned alive in the Ananuri fortress. The actors in this tragedy may not have bothered to explore the global causes. They were driven only by a thirst for power and personal revenge. However, the tragedy of Ananuri Fortress once again shows us how much caution is needed when living in the epicenter of a geopolitical controversy.
The outcome of this tragic story best illustrates the most likely outcome of the externally powered internal political battles. For several more years, Shan Shea fought, sometimes on one side and sometimes on another. At last, he was captured by the Persians and was blinded. After that, the main figure in Kartli was the former comrade of Shan Shea and then his enemy, Givi Amilakvari. However, soon after, Amilakvari was also attacked by the Persians and he was also sent to Isfahan to be blinded. So, Sanja Aristavi, already blinded in Persia, and Givi Amilakvari, who was going to Persia, met on the way. They sat down and talked a lot. They might even have agreed upon something. Many people have prayed in this church for centuries, but today it is only occasionally possible to light a candle here as the church has been on the lake bottom for months. It can only be seen when the water level is low. With each appearance, more and more damage is visible and the roof has already collapsed. However, despite the ordeal, the church is still standing. Our boat sails into the Jean Valley Reservoir, which has an area of 11.5 square kilometers and contains 500 million cubic meters of water. Its maximum depth is 75 meters. It operates a power plant and, at the same time, more than half of Tbilisi's population gets its drinking water from Jean Valley. However, the topic of our conversation today is not the reservoir itself, but the city that the reservoir covers. In the middle of the Aragvi Valley, at its narrowest point, there was the town of Jean Valley. Any caravan or army coming from the north must pass this place. From Jean Valley, several branches of the road lead to Khornabuchi. Jean Valley is mentioned in historical sources together with Tbilisi and Gori, and whoever owned it also controlled the main highway. Jean Valley was an important center through which the Georgian kingdom controlled its mountainous region. In the second half of the fourth century, the process of Christianization of the Georgian highlands began from here. Jean Valley was a key point on the Caucasus Highway through which goods from China, India, or Asia Minor passed through the North Caucasus. Thanks to this road, the city of Jean Valley became an important strategic center in the South Caucasus. People have lived in these places since ancient times. In the first centuries, Jean Valley was already an urban settlement. 
the construction and strengthening of the Caucasus Highway infrastructure by Vakhtang Gorgasali increased its importance even more. In the third to sixth centuries, Jinvali reached a high level of development. This is confirmed by the substantial evidence found during the evacuations. Buildings, pottery, glassware, iron weapons and agricultural tools, musical instruments, coins, gold, silver, bronze, iron and glass jewelry, a considerable part of which was made on site while another part was imported. In the 1980s, Several millennia of Jinvali history were covered by water so quickly that it could not be properly excavated and studied. Nevertheless, what archaeologists have managed to find shows that we are dealing with one of the most significant monuments in the history of Georgia. There is a possibility that the greatest Georgian writer, or simply put, the greatest Georgian of all times, a person who made a huge contribution to the formation of the Georgian worldview, lived in this submerged city. Some researchers claim that Shoto Rustaveli was from Jinvali and that The Night in Panther's Skin was also written here. This is a 13th century deed of mercy kept at the Institute of Manuscripts in Tbilisi. This document is signed by King Tamar herself and the owner of Jinvali Shota. The story is as follows. Queen Tamar gave the city of Jinvali to Chiaber Mandaturt Ukhutsesi. In return, Chiaber gifted trader slaves from Jinvali to the Kvime Monastery. And this document tells us about it. The deed of mercy is signed and the gift is confirmed by King Tamar herself. It is already a great story where we can see Tamar's facsimile. The main intrigue is that this document is also signed by someone named Shota, probably the son of Chiaber, who owned Jinvali after Chiaber. According to some scholars, he is the author of The Night in the Panther's Skin. Given the strong traditions of the poetry of this area and the amazing poetic masterpieces created here, this account does not seem totally unbelievable. Jinvali was a large city where caravans would rest for a few days, replenish supplies, trade, and only then go on their way. Two routes started from here. One of them passed Zedazeni Monastery and followed the Kacheti Ridge to Hornabuji. The other went to Tianeti. In the next episode, our TV caravan will move forward to Zetazeni and we will return to the Tianeti Road later. <laughs>